Okay, so we're going to talk about discovering God's will. How many of you have struggled at different times in life and you say, man, I just don't know what God wants me to do next. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of out on a limb here and I don't know what to do. You ever been there? And you wanted to know God's will, but you didn't exactly know how to figure out what God's will was? Well, that's all we're going to talk about today, discovering God's will. We're going to start with um, the opening lines of what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a model prayer. It was an example on how to pray. Jesus wasn't really praying when he gave this prayer. He was doing something they asked him to do. They came to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he taught them how to pray. And one of the most important things in the prayer, right up front as he begins the prayer in teaching them how to pray, is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've taught us how to pray. I thank you that in that prayer, you focus on the supreme importance of your will being done on earth. From a practical standpoint, Lord, if your will is going to be done on earth, it's going to be because your people do your will. And it's worked out right here on planet earth. So, Father, teach us how to discover your will, as you have taught us how in Scripture. Father, I pray that you'll open our hearts today, that we'll want your will enough to do the work of discovering your will. I pray that. In Jesus' name, and for his sake, and amen. amen. So let's start with the introduction here. Jesus, Jesus taught his disciples an incredible, incredible principle regarding the discovery of God's will when he taught them how to pray, that model prayer that we just looked at. In the Lord's Prayer, he taught them to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we ought to want God's will so that we pray and ask God to do his will right here on planet earth. And in fact, to do it in us. So if we pray like Jesus wants us to pray, we will, we will not only ask God to do his will, but also that we will be willing to obey his will. As I look back in my life, and perhaps you can look back in yours and make the same discovery, God was orchestrating the events of life to show me his will. God, God showed me verses of scripture that actually in retrospect were his revelation of his will, but I didn't always see it because I didn't always want it. You ever been there? God's showing you how you got to do some hard things, make some hard choices, involve yourself in some unpleasant situations in order to get to the place where you can actually experience his will, but we're often not willing to do what it takes to get there. And so we got to be willing to do his will when he shows it to us. You see, it's pointless to ask for God's will if we're not willing to obey God's will when he shows it to us. Willingness to obey God's will is one of the most important aspects of discovering his will. Why would God take the time to show you his will if he knows you don't want it anyway? Wouldn't that be a little bit of a waste of his time? And his energy, and listen, God's got plenty to do without wasting his time on us if we don't really want to know what he wants us to do. And so that's a real foundational point. Often when we pray, God, show me your will, what we really mean is, Lord, give me some, some feeling. You know, lots of people try to determine God's will by their feeling. They say, they say I just feel in my heart that this is what I'm supposed to do. You ever heard that? You ever said that? I, I just know in my heart this is what I'm supposed to do. You know what the problem with that is? You know what the Bible says about your heart? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You don't want to rely on your heart to show you what God wants you to do. Your heart will deceive you every time. You don't want to rely, you want to rely on the word of God to give you the revelation of his will. So, so don't depend on some feeling. Sometimes when we pray that, we, we want some special revelation, some vision in the night. Listen to me. <laughs> when we go to God and say, God, give me a revelation, show me. I think God looks down at us and says, 
You idiot. I gave you 66 books of Revelation. Get in the book and I'll reveal to you from the book what I want you to do. I've already given you the foundation. Now all you got to do is get in the book and what you got to do is, is let me reveal how what I have said in my word applies to your life today so that you can walk in his will. You get that? We want to bypass the hard work of studying and memorizing and meditating and, and engrafting the word into our heart so that the word can then reflect to us what the will of God is in our life in any situation. And we want God to treat us like his special child and say, you can bypass all that. Here it is. Here's a direct revelation of what I want you to do. We've got to be careful about that. God's told us how important his word is in Scripture. You see, the word of God will shine God's light on his will so we can see it. King David wrote this in Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word, get that? Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. What's he saying there? You want direction? You want to know which step to take next? You want to know which direction to head in? You know, want to know what God wants? What's the key? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you know what that, do you know what those lamp, that lamp and that light is? That, that lamp was a little foot lamp. You see, in Palestine, if they were going to travel at night, they had, to, they had to just walk through these unlit, unlit, very dark footpaths. And so what they did was they developed these little lamps, little clay lamps. It was kind of like a, a cream pitcher. <laughs> made out of clay and it had a little spout and, and, they, and they filled it with oil and put a lid on it and then th there was a wick coming out of that spout and, and that wick would burn and draw the oil up through the wick and, and, and it was strapped to the tops of their feet. That's why it was a lamp for my feet. Strapped it to the tops of their feet. And here's the deal. If they were going to travel at night, they were only going to be given enough light from that lamp to see what the next step should be. You get that? Once they had made that step, then that lamp on the top of that foot would give them enough light to see what the next step should be. He didn't light the whole pathway for a half a mile in front of them so they could see how it was all going to be and see what they needed to do way out there in the future. Most of the time when God reveals his will, it is a one step at a time, one moment at a time issue as he gives us revelation from his word. We often miss his will because we are not relying on his word. And David said, your word is a lamp to my feet that provides a light for my path. Do you get that? That's why crucially important it is that you stay in your word. That's why it's so important that, that every week in your bulletin, there are daily Bible readings. And if you read through those every week of the year, in one year you will have read through the entire Bible. You need to get the big picture of the Word of God so you can see the heart of God and the mind of God and not just pick out those favorite verses that you like. Do you get that? We need the whole story. And so it's important that we do that. There is a marvelous section of Scripture in the book of Acts that reveals four major principles regarding the discovery of God's will. It records a scene that occurred near the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. You know, first, Paul and Barnabas went out on a missionary journey, then they got in a fuss and parted ways. And then Paul and Silas went out on a missionary journey, and they picked up some other people along the way, and they were on that second journey, and Paul and Silas had decided to form a team and, and to visit the churches that Paul and Barnabas had planted on the first missionary journey. And their goal was to strengthen those churches. And, and as, as we'll see, their travel plans changed several times before they finally understood the will of God. So if you struggle with understanding the will of God in any given situation, don't feel too bad. Paul had that. I mean, if Paul had it, and he was one of the greatest men of God that's ever lived, single-handedly changed the world of his day through his preaching of the gospel, if Paul struggled with this, do you think maybe we might struggle with it as well? 
That's why we need to know from the Word of God how to deal with this. So Luke painted the picture in these five insightful verses. This is what, what he wrote. These, these verses are, are found in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 10. It says, Paul and his companions, that's the missionary team, they traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been, get this now, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. You get that? The Holy Spirit would not let them go to Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, based on that story out of the life of the Apostle Paul, I want us to talk about how to discover God's will. You see, this little slice of life from the first century shows us how the will of God can be discovered in the ordinary routine of life. What happened to these missionaries often happens to us. We struggle to understand God's will. So the important question is, how can we discover the will of God? And this text, this story that we just read reveals four answers to that question. Answer number one, how can I discover the will of God? You got to understand this. Discovering God's will requires obedience to your life calling. You get that? When this happened, and God, they tried three to go in three different directions, and finally God showed them the direction they wanted them to go in, it was because they were already being obedient to God's calling on their life. They had already surrendered and said, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You want me to preach the gospel? You want me to be a witness to you from now till doomsday? Okay, God, that's what I'll do. I'll travel all over Europe and Asia, and I'll share the word of God if that's what you want me to do. They had already surrendered to their life calling. That's why they were on the missionary journey to begin with. If you haven't surrendered to God's calling on your life, and every one of you has a calling from God on your life, if you haven't surrendered that, and begun to identify that, then you're going to be struggling and struggling and struggling to know the will of God on the every, in the everyday routine of life. When Paul gave his testimony to the Jewish court before King Agrippa, he had been arrested in Jerusalem, transported to Caesarea. He was charged with propagating an illegal religion in the Roman Empire, and he was guilty. Because he was propagating Christianity, and Christianity was illegal as far as the Romans were concerned. You know why the Romans declared Christianity to be an illegal empire or illegal religion in their empire? Because they believed that there was only one God, and it was not Caesar. <laughs> You see, to be a good Roman citizen, you were required to raise your hand and swear allegiance to Caesar as a god. And the Christians refused to do that. And that's why they burned them at the stake and they cut their heads off and they saw them in two and they boiled them in oil and they did all kinds of things to them because they were considered an enemy of the state. And so the Romans hated the Christians. And so, and so when Paul was called into court there in Caesarea before a Roman court, he gave his testimony and this is what he said. He said, about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road. He was on the road to Damascus, just outside the city limits of the city of Damascus. The city of Damascus is still a city today, capital of Syria, where there's a civil war going on and the Muslims are in control, by the way. What a sad story is that? Syria used to be one of the hotbeds of Christianity, but the devil hath made such inroads that today Syria is a stronghold of Islam, the enemy he said, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I love that. I, th the thing that really strikes me there is Jesus spoke to them that day. 
These are highly religious people. These are highly educated people. Paul was one of the most highly educated people of his day. And you know what Jesus did when he talked to him? He spoke to him in Aramaic. You know what Aramaic was? It was a form of Hebrew that was like the street language of Hebrew. I love that. You know what that tells me? That tells me when you get ready to tell somebody about Jesus, leave your church language at the church house. Go out there and talk to them in everyday language. If they speak street language, speak street language. If, they, if, if they're moderately educated, then you speak to them in moderately educated terms. If they're highly educated and you can, you speak to them in highly educated terms. You communicate the gospel to people in ways that they can understand it. That's what we got to remember. we got to do that. And so he spoke to them in Aramaic and he said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then I asked, who are you? And look at this. Who are you? And how does he address him with a question mark? Lord? Is it really you? Are, are, are you really alive after you were dead? Is this really you talking to me? Are you really who you said you were? Because you remember at this point, Paul does not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He believed he was a fake, a fraud. He was glad when he was executed. And he's, he's bent on stamping out Christianity. He's, he's traveling on this particular trip to arrest Christians and take them back to Jerusalem and have them executed. And now Jesus appears to him and it's like, whoa, there's a major world shift about to happen in Paul's life. Who are you, Lord? I love this. If you ever get to the place where you really want to know who Jesus is, and by the way, what's the point in knowing his will in your life if you don't really care who he is? If you ever get to the place where you really want to know who Jesus is, he is more than happy to tell you. Because look what happens here. He says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I like that. He just introduced himself to Paul. Paul evidently believes it as we go on to the rest of the story. And you know what Jesus says? As soon as Paul understands who he is, do you know what Jesus said? Your life is no longer your own. I am about to bring about a radical shift in your agenda. Get up on your feet. I love that. Jesus is a little bossy. He has the right to be bossy. He's the master, and we're the slaves. And so he says, get up on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Do you get that? I was not disobedient means I obeyed. I surrendered to this call of God on my life. He said you're supposed to be a servant and you're supposed to be a witness of what you have seen and what you are going to see of me. Now get up and get with the program. Isn't that what God just told him? And you know what Paul did? He got with the program. He surrendered to this call of God on his life. God revealed to Paul that he was to be a servant and a witness to the Gentiles. And then he testified to the king that he was not disobedient to that calling. He said, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. He was obedient to his life calling. So you see, one of the ways that Paul knew what God's will in his life was is that he surrendered to the calling of God on his life. He just decided, whatever that is, I'm going to be obedient to it. Paul was on a mission from God to tell the Jesus story from that moment on. He was going to be a witness. You know what a witness does? A witness just states the facts. You're called into court. You're going to give your testimony. What is it? You just state the facts. You remember the old Dragnet uh, nightly television show? Do you guys remember that? Some of you are too young to remember that. <sighs> young people. Some of you godly older people, you remember that. Okay? Here it is. Dragnet was a detective show, and they always caught the bad guys. But, but, but at the end of, of the show, or at the beginning of the show, they're always interrogating somebody, and, and they're always trying to give their opinion about something, and the detective will say, nothing but the facts, ma'am. Nothing but the facts. Do you remember that? Nothing but the facts. That's what witnesses do. You don't give your opinion. You don't give your ideas. You don't tell people what you think. You just state the facts. Now, where do you get the facts about Jesus? Out of this book right here. 
You got to get in the book and you got to know what the facts about Jesus are and then just tell people the facts. That's what a witness does. And Paul was, he was from that moment on, on a mission to tell people the Jesus story. That was the motivating factor that explains his life. That's why he made one hazardous missionary journey after another. He, he determined to go wherever he could to tell the Jesus story. The thing that he didn't know at that moment was exactly where God wanted him to tell the story just at that moment. I mean, he was out there ready to tell the story. And he tried to go to three different places and the Holy Spirit shut it down. And then finally, through the process of elimination, God showed him which way he was supposed to go. You, you see, the question he had was where he should preach and not if he should preach. Do you get that? So if you're supposed to be a witness, if you're on mission for God, if you're doing whatever it is that God wants you to do and God closes some door in front of you, that doesn't mean he doesn't want you to do it. It just means that there's another direction he wants you to go to get it done. We've got to understand that. And so the, the, the question he had was where he should preach, not if he should preach. And God was about to answer that question. You see, these men were traveling witnesses. We call them missionaries. What do missionaries do? They tell the Jesus story. Anytime and anywhere they have the opportunity. And these guys were just searching for the place where God wanted them to tell the story. And because they were willing to obey their life calling, God was willing to show them the next step. So discovering God's will begins by being obedient to your life calling. You can't be obedient to it if you don't identify what it is. And the way you identify that is you get in your word and listen to God as he speaks to you through his word. That's another whole sermon. Now, answer number two, discovering the will of God requires obedience to the Holy Spirit. You got to be obedient to your life calling, but you got to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Paul and his preaching team wanted to go east into Asia, but Luke wrote that they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Get that? So it's not just doing the right thing, it's doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. They wanted to go preach in Asia, but the Holy Spirit kept them. It said they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So the question is, how did the Holy Spirit do that? How did the Holy Spirit keep them from going to Asia? Let me give you the clear theological answer. Are you ready for this? This is right out of the Greek. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea how the Holy Spirit kept them from doing it on this occasion because he doesn't tell us. He could have used circumstances to keep them out of Asia. Perhaps the road was washed out. Maybe there was a Jewish opposition so they couldn't get there. The Holy Spirit could have communicated through an inner impression. A prophet might have delivered the message. No one knows how it happened, but somehow they knew they were not to go to Asia, and they believed that was the Holy Spirit keeping them out of Asia. Now, can't the Holy Spirit work in all those ways I just mentioned? I pulled those out of different stories from the Scripture where God did exactly those things. So they decided to go north. God wouldn't let them go east. So they decided to go north toward Bithynia. Why? Because they intended to tell the Jesus story there. They knew that's what they were supposed to be doing. They were still being obedient to their life calling, but again, they were redirected by the Holy Spirit. Luke wrote this in Acts 16, 7. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Again, the Bible doesn't explain how it happened, but somehow they knew that the Holy Spirit was saying no. We don't know how it happened, but we do know that they knew that the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go to Bithynia. You get that? Now, do we have to know everything there is to know about the Holy Spirit and how he's going to work for him to work? No. We just got to look at the situation as it comes along and be sensitive and be willing to obey the Holy Spirit. And so that's what they did. So they headed west to preach the gospel and ended up in a place called Troas. Luke wrote about it in Acts 16, 8. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. So what was going on here? God was revealing his will through the work of the Holy Spirit when his people were willing to be obedient 
to the Holy Spirit. Why would the Holy Spirit show you the will of God if you're not going to be obedient to it? When they were obedient to, 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 to the will of God as the Holy Spirit was directing and, and, and revealing that to them, then he showed them where he wanted them to go. They went down to Troas. And what an incredible thing happened when they got to Troas. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's give another answer to this question. How do I discover the will of God? The third thing is, discovering the will of God may be the result of a vision. I want you to get that. Discovering the will of God. Now get this. Next word, most important word in this sentence. May be the result of a vision. When the missionary team arrived at the seaport town of Troas, Paul received a nighttime vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him. This is in Acts 16, 9. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul was in Troas, which was in Asia. But Macedonia was in Greece, which was on the continent of Europe. And between the two was the Aegean Sea. So what is significant about the vision of the man from Macedonia? When Paul went to Macedonia, he took the Jesus story for the very first time from Asia to Europe, from one continent to another. That represents a major historic expansion of the Christian faith. From the moment Paul stepped on Macedonian soil, Christianity was no longer simply an Eastern religion. It was now beginning to make its way around the known world of that day. We have just crossed from one continent to another. When Paul preached in Macedonia, it was the first time the gospel was ever shared on the continent of Europe. That was an incredibly important thing. And God gave him the direction to do that through a nighttime vision. Sometimes God reveals his will supernaturally through visions. A careful study of scripture reveals, I want you to get this, this is where a lot of people miss it. Sometimes he does that. But if you carefully study scripture, you will see that he doesn't do it very often but he does do it. Just read through your New Testament. Sometimes God gives people visions. But you know when he gave people visions? When they were already surrendered to his will for their lives. When they were already willing to do the will of God and they were obedient to their life calling and then so that they can live out their life calling God would give them a vision but I got news for you when I study through this book even the Old Testament and in the New Testament I find that when God gave somebody a vision it was somebody who was already determined to do the will of God I, I see these people out here that, that don't obviously by their lifestyle they don't care about the will of God and they're telling me oh God gave me this vision and God gave me this vision and God revealed this to me in a vision and God did all that and I want to say to them are you sure it wasn't the pepperoni pizza that you ate before you went to bed <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying here every time you have a dream does not mean that God is giving you something um, a, a vision for your life sometimes we have dreams that are just of the flesh sometimes they're just of the devil but sometimes God can give you a vision but the way you got to safeguard yourself is you got to ask yourself the question, do I really want the will of God and am I being obedient to my life calling? If the answer to either of those questions is no, you got to scratch your head and say, was this a vision or a bad dream? Is this from God or is this from the pepperoni pizza? What is this? You got to look at that. And you got to ask that question and be honest about that. Here's the world. Here, here, here's the deal. As I said, he does sometimes, on some occasions, give people a vision to reveal his will. That's exactly what he did in this story about Paul's missionary team. But the important thing to remember is that, is that Paul received a vision, but the vision was in complete harmony with the Word of God. Sometimes people tell me, oh, they had a vision and God wants this. And then I look at Scripture and say, according to the Scripture, that ain't what God wants. So is God going to give you a vision directing you to violate Scripture? To break what He said in His Word? No. 
He's not going to do that at all. And so the vision must be in complete harmony with the Word of God. In order to know if the vision that you received was actually from God, you've got to know enough about the Word of God to see if the vision is actually in harmony with the Word of God. You see, Jesus had already said this, and Paul knew this. Mark had written it down. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Go into where? All the world. Not just Asia. If they're going to go into all the world, they're going to have to leave the continent of Asia and go to the continent of Europe. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So God could know, I mean, Paul could know that the vision he received was in harmony with the word of God because God had already said that. In John 3, 16, God said that he loved just Asians? No, the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We could go on and on and on. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He wanted people all over the planet to hear the Jesus story. And so their leaving Asia and going into Europe was in complete harmony with his word because he wanted the Europeans to hear it too. Here's the fourth answer to the question. The will of God is often discovered through wise counsel. Luke revealed this principle of God's guidance when he wrote this. It's in Acts chapter 16, verse 10. It's in the same story. After Paul had seen the vision, you see, he didn't, just, he didn't just see the vision and then say, okay, here we go. He didn't just do that. Look at this. After Paul had seen the vision, we got it ready at once to leave for Macedonia. Now look at this. Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, I tell you often, that in order to really understand what's going on in these Bible stories, you have to get the correct definition to every word. Because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That word concluding is one of those words. If you look that up in Greek, that word concluding means to discuss a matter with other people, debate the alternatives, and arrive at a conclusion. It's a word that implies the strategic use of the mind. When Paul had this vision, guess what happened? He told the other guys traveling with him what the vision was. Luke was one of those, because look what Luke writes here in this 10th verse. After Paul had seen the vision, we, which implies what? Luke was part of the group, or he would have said they. You get that? He was traveling with them at this time. So he said, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now that word concluding indicates that that group of disciples, Paul and Silas and Luke and maybe Timothy and Titus and some others who were in the group by this time traveling as this missionary team, that they had discussed the matter, that they had considered the alternatives, that they had arrived at a conclusion In other words, Paul got some counsel from the people who were traveling with him about this whole vision that he had had. They engaged in wise counsel, and they reached a conclusion. Their conclusion was, God wants us to go into Macedonia, so they responded. And Luke wrote about their response in the last part of verse number 10. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. You see, on this occasion, the will of God was revealed not only through the vision, but through the wise counsel that took place about the vision once Paul had shared what the vision was. You get that? You know what that tells me? God is not a lone ranger kind of God. You know what I mean by that? How many of you remember the lone ranger? Heaven help us. Some of you do. I mean, the lone ranger just got on his horse and rode off into the sunset and just did whatever, right? And Tonto followed along right? He didn't didn't check with anybody. He just got on his horse and rode off. God doesn't work that way in his kingdom. God doesn't have any lone ranger Christians in his kingdom. Whenever God gives us a vision, if we get a vision through the night and God gives us a vision, we check it out by the word. And then if we're wise like Paul was and we really want the will of God and not our own will, then we check with other people, other people that are involved. 
the spiritual partners that God brings into our lives and we discuss it together and we're open in the debate and, and we consider all the alternatives and, and, and then the Holy Spirit brings us all into agreement and then we proceed. Do you get that? It's important that we do that. It's very, very important that we understand that. And so that's exactly what they did. So here's the conclusion. Notice that once they determined God's will, they immediately did it. Get that? What's the only, the only sensible reason to want to know God's will and for God to reveal it to you? It's so you can do it. Why, why would God even bother if he knows you're not going to do it? And so they did it. Luke wrote in, in the last part of verse number 10, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. Some people say, man, I know the will of God for my life, and as soon as I get this done and this done and this done and that done and something else done, man, I'm going to do it. Is that what they did? No. When God revealed it to them and by wise counsel they agreed and understood what God's will was, they were to be the ones to take the gospel from Asia into Europe. They did it. It's just like the Nike commercial. And I'm not promoting Nike because you know there's a lot of stuff about Nike but the one thing I like about them is their logo just do it when you know what the will of God is just do it and let God take care of all the details let God take care of all the what ifs and the yeah buts and all that let God take care of all of that just do the will of God when you've discovered the will of God then what's the next step just do it don't sit around and pray about it do you have to pray about whether or not you should do the will of God no when God reveals his will to you it's not time to pray it's time to do you just do it and so, and so you, just, you just do it. And do you talk about it once you've already had your wise counsel and you've determined what God wants you to do? Do you have to talk it to death? No. Just do it. G get up and do it. James wrote this in James 4, 17. Tim who knows to do good and does not do it. So God's revealed his will. Through his word, through a vision, through wise counsel, through circumstances, God's revealed his will. And you say, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to do that right now. I've got to do this. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, what does he say? To him it is sin. Get that? You know the will of God and you don't do it? It's sin. I know people don't like the use of that word today. But right there it is. If you know to do good and you choose not to do it, he says that's sin. So when you know God's will, just do it. If you don't know God's will, look at these four principles that are evident in the story about Paul and the missionary companion. And do we think that they got it right? Do we think that he, they used those four principles and got it right? Multiplied thousands of people were swept into the kingdom of God because they finally discovered it was God's will for them to go to Europe. You are sitting here today in this Christian church because they got it right on the other side of the planet centuries ago. Because the gospel went from Asia to Europe and from Europe to the new world that has come to be called America. And it has gone all the way around the planet. We are here today because they discovered the will of God and they got it right. Do you get that? A handful of men that got it right and acted on it is why we are all here today. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? You see how important it is that we discover the will of God?